All rise. Superior Court is now in session. Dr. Judge Henry R. Thompson is presiding. Thank you. Be seated. Hastings? Yes, sir. I'm Mr. Clyde, Your Honor. I, I am actually here on the second set of motions, the motions for access to the file, for to unseal the, the file. Where's Mr. Kimbrough? Very good. Oh, why don't you take that table? Your Honor, with your permission, I'm going to just sit off here. That's fine. And Ms. Merchant? Good morning, Judge. Good morning. I'm and here I'm sorry? I'm here. Uh, Right. Why don't you come on up to the table as well? There's a chair for you. And Mr. Axum. Yes, good morning, Judge. All right. Okay. Um, who wants to share in the takedown of this? Mr. Kimbrough? Yes, Judge, we'll share. Ms. Hastings? Ms. Merchant? We'll share. Okay. We will as well, Your Honor. Okay. How about you, Mr. Axum? You want to share in the takedown? Absolutely. All right. Okay. <clears throat> this is Wade versus Wade. Uh, civil action number 21108166. And Mr. Wade is represented by Mr. Scott Kimbrough. Mrs. Wade is represented by Andrea Hastings. And we're here today for basically an emergency motion filed by Mr. Axum uh, by a non-party deponent for a protective order, uh, but there was already a pending motion to unseal the record uh, filed by his merchant. I thought we might as well take that up at the same time. Now, this is my criminal jury trial week. I'm trying to start jury selection on a criminal trial, so we don't have a lot of time. All right, Ms. Merchant? I'll hear from you on your motion to unseal. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Judge. Um, would you like me to go again? <clears throat> Wherever you like. Okay, thank you. I will be brief, Judge. Thank you. Um, Judge Rule 24 says that there's a very specific process that has to be followed for a order sealing a record. It wasn't followed in this case. It was um, assigned to a previous judge, Judge Angela Brown, who entered a consent order under Rule 21. Uh, granting the seal in this case. It's our understanding from emails with counsel that um, Ms. Mrs. Wade's lawyers do not object to that seal order being lifted. I believe Mr. Wade's lawyers do, um, but we believe that it should be reversed and should be lifted because it was held without a hearing. It was held, as far as I understand, without a motion, and I can't guarantee that because I don't have access to those earlier records in the case because they are sealed. But um, it appears it was held it was it was filed without a, without an actual uh, court hearing where the public was allowed to be present, and so that's a violation of Rule Twenty One. Uh, there's very specific and stringent processes that the court must follow before a record is withheld from the public, and they were not followed in this case, Judge. Um, the first is the motion. The second is a hearing. The third is that whoever wants it sealed has to identify specific parts of the court's file that need to be sealed. Um, also has to delineate the nature and the duration of the seal. None of that was done in this case. Um, and the fourth, which is the most important part of it, is the analysis that the court has to do. And what the law says in the seminal case is Atlanta Journal versus Long, which we cited in our motion, um, that an order limiting access shall not be granted except upon a finding of harm otherwise resulting to the privacy of the person in interest and that harm clearly outweighs the public interest. In this case, Judge, there's been no allegations of harm that clearly outweigh the public interest. And so the first, uh, the first thing to consider is whether or not that order needs to be reversed. And it's our position that it does because it doesn't follow the law. Um, second, getting to whether or not an order should actually be entered now sealing this, we do not believe that an order should be sealed. Has anyone filed one? No one has filed one. So um, if you reverse the order at that 
point, if someone files it, then we can we can litigate that. But just focusing on the reversal of the prior order, Judge, I think the law is clear that it should be reversed um, because none of those findings were made and the public didn't have an opportunity to be heard in that instance. And so that's, that's in violation of the law. And there's a couple different cases, um, I won't belabor the point, but all of the cases on, on this issue hold if there wasn't a hearing, it's got to be reversed. And so we think that that order should be vacated. Um, I've prepared a, a proposed order unsealing that um, if the court is so inclined. And then if there is some type of a motion filed or an order motion or an oral motion today to try and seal those records, if you are inclined to reverse, I'd like a chance to at least be heard on that as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Hastings, what's your position? Your position, your position, Your Honor. My position is that we did consent to the sealing at the beginning of the case. There was a motion filed by the plaintiff on, on November 18, 2021, approximately 16 days after we filed this. Um, we consented at the time. We have different information now. We also understand that the um, there was no hearing conducted, so we have uh, no objection. Mr. Kimbrough. Thank you, Judge. Um, these parties did consent to this uh, the previous consent order sealing the record uh, back in, in February of 2022. Judge, the divorce was filed November 2nd of 2021. The answer was filed on November 30th of 2021. And this consent order sealing the record was filed on February 10th of 2022. Because it's clear that the parties, and what the parties' intent was at that time, and that was to protect their privacy. Um, as such, a consent order was drafted between uh, the attorneys who were involved at that time, of Dean Ms. Hastings, and her team were involved at that time. I was not, uh, did not get involved in this case until uh, toward the end of last year. But that consent order was drafted and presented to the court, uh, and it was signed and filed. Uh, and Judge, this, this court has uh, a burden uh, to determine you know, what is in the best interest of these parties and what's in the best interest of this case. Um, the law is, is, is pretty clear as far as this issue is concerned. Uh, under the Atlanta Journal v. Long, 258 Georgia 410, uh, it, it sets forth the purpose of Rule 21, which is the reason why we're here. Uh, dealing with access or limited access to court files. Uh, the purpose is, one, to protect the public right to access, uh, which is a long-standing and traditional right, but also, Judge, uh, that case holds that it is also to protect uh, another traditional right, and that is the right of superior courts in exceptional cases to shield uh, these records from public view. And the court has to weigh that. Um, as far as this situation is concerned, uh, the current status of this situation, what has happened since um, uh, January 8th uh, of this year, uh, clearly shows the harm that is done to these parties and clearly gives credence to what the parties' intentions were back in uh, February of 2022 when they entered into this agreement to seal. Uh, and we think that, um, uh, that it is proper for the case to remain under seal. Now, again, I was not involved back in 2022 uh, in this matter. Um, it is my understanding there was not a hearing that was done. Uh, it was just a consent order that was prepared and presented uh, to the court. Not this court, uh, but prepared and presented to the court. Uh, and that order was signed off on and, and filed. Um, and so we think that if, if this court does, based upon those facts, um, unseal this record that this court should also consider putting in protections uh, for the party's private information uh, pursuant to 9117.1, uh, which allows this court to do that. Thank you, Judge. Your, your Honor, our motion is very similar. I understand. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I find that um, the prior order, although it was by consent of parties, uh, was not properly entered because the Uniform Superior Court rules require a hearing to be had. Uh, we can find no evidence that any such hearing was ever had, so I'm going to grant the motion <coughs> vacating the consent order sealing the record. And I'll do that today. I'll have your written order. Ms. Merchant, 
Uh, unless you have something else, you're excused. Yeah, thank you so much, Judge. Yes. Well done, Counselor. <laughs> now we have Mr. Axum's motion uh, for by a non-party deponent for a protective order. Um, Mr. Axum and Miss uh, Hastings has filed a response to that. Uh, before we get started, uh, Mr. Axe and Ms. Hastings, I'll go ahead and tell you both. I've read the pleadings, so you don't have to read them back to me, okay, in making your arguments. Mr. Axum, if you would, sir, I just need for you to focus your argument today on subsection one of your motion for a protective order, if you don't mind. So you may proceed, Mr. Axum. Okay, thank you, Judge. Give me one second. you are asking me, and I will, I will be brief, um, to focus on subsection 1. I think there is some more to prove that I, I don't know if it's come up. I don't know if the court um, had the opportunity to examine it. But before we get to subsection 1, I, I really do apologize. I, I would like to handle the issue as to whether the two subpoenas that have been served are defective. Well, um, we don't need to reach that yet, Mr. Axum, if you'll focus your argument on subsection one and tell me why the protective sure. order should be granted. If it is granted, then we don't really need to reach the subpoena argument. So like I said, press for time. Said, this is my criminal jury trial week. Just argue subsection one. I sure will. All right, so dealing with subsection one, your honor, uh, which deals with 26.9 and 26.1. Uh, specifically, my argument uh, hinges on the pleadings. Now, I have not seen the pleadings, but based on the argument that I put forward, this is an uncontested, I will. It's a no-fault divorce, and based on that, both parties have alleged that it's irretrievably broken. And because they've alleged that, and the pleadings as they stand deal specifically with whether the arguments, hang on one second, give me one second, let me hold that up. All right. The response in the uh, plaintiff's pleadings alleges that it is permissible to bring up issues regarding the conduct of the parties. But I believe the pleadings are the things that set the boundaries. So in this case, a no fault discovery um, alleging adultery is not relevant. The defendant brings up in the response that the plaintiff did not tell the defendant he was separated. The plaintiff did not comply with discovery until the motion was actually filed. The plaintiff may have, may have used marital funds for the trip, but every one of those issues involves the plaintiff's actions during the divorce. Had nothing to do with Ms. Willis. The issue before the court, if it's a no-fault divorce, and it's irretrievably broken, is how do you define the marital assets? And that is the issue that was brought up in the response. So specifically, we're dealing with equitable division of marital, the marital, marital estate, the dissipation of the marital assets, and the plaintiff's capacity 
to provide spousal support. So those three things are the things that the court has to deal with. All of those things sit squarely with the plaintiff. Ms. Willis does not share any accounts with him. D.A. Willis does not determine what he spends his money on, no matter where it comes from. So the issue is, if there's, if it's a no fault and it's irretrievably broken, and the pleadings dictate the boundaries of the case, it's not relevant as to fault. It's not relevant as to the conduct of the parties. So that's essentially my argument with regard to the irretrievably broken in 26.1. Um, I believe 26.1 protects because this uh, district attorney Byron Willis is an officer as it is defined in 26.1. So it protects her. And according to 26.1b, there are two requirements that have to be met. The officer has to be high ranking, and I don't think that's in dispute. When you look at um, Ms. Willis and the demands on her office, Ms. Willis, as the Fulton County Office of the District Attorneys, the only way I can put this into context is to give you some background on that. She manages a staff of 360 plus lawyers and staff. She oversees cases right now, 20,000 open cases. She coordinates on a monthly basis at least 500 or more cases for indictment. So in this case, of course, the most recognizable issue is that she's dealing with, over in Fulton County, the election interference tax involving former President Trump. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Axon, let me interrupt you. Let me yes. ask you just to focus on the part of the law that says um, the proposed opponent lacks unique personal knowledge of any matter that's relevant. Are you saying that uh, your client lacks unique personal knowledge that could not be discovered some other way? I would argue that she does, that the knowledge that she may or may not have is not unique. Um, you've got two parties in the case, one who is alleged to have some extramarital affair with Ms. Willis. If that is the case, if that is the case, if that is true, he has that information. We've been at this case, well I have, but 783 days, and on day 776, somewhere in there, we get this notice of deposition. So to, to focus on that part of the section, no. I think there's, there are other means by which that information can be retrieved in this case. All right, thank you, Mr. Axon. Ms. Hastings? Where are we? Your Honor, I think that you honed in on exactly what the issue is here today, um, naturally. The face of her pleading shows that she has unique knowledge with regards to this case. She could have filed a motion for protective order alleging all of the legal grounds for which she would like to not have to sit for a deposition. She believes she's protected, but she didn't stop there. She went further. She asserted in her pleading, her motion for protective order to prevent herself from sitting for a deposition, that she knows, is the, cause, she knows the cause of the separation of these people. She knows detailed facts, allegedly, about their relationship. And albeit we'll deal with the falsity of those at a different hearing, that's what she said. She said it in her pleading. So on its face, her argument fails that she does not have unique knowledge with regards to the party's marriage and this situation. Beyond that, Your Honor, I would turn the court, obviously, to 9-11-26-C and Ewing versus Ewing. 
which clearly states a party seeking a protective order with regards to discovery, when a party does, the trial court may make an order which justice requires to protect the party or person from annoyance, harassment, oppression, etc. However, protective order should not be awarded when the effect is to frustrate and prevent legitimate discovery. Furthermore, the Georgia Court of Appeals has held that protective orders are intended to be protective, not prohibitive, and that's exactly what D.A. Willis is seeking to do in this case. She's not seeking protection, she's seeking prohibition of our ability to access facts. I can say as an officer of the court in my place here today that the first time in the 783 days that this case has been pending, the first time that I heard that the alleged cause of the separation was some false claim with regards to my client in 2017 was in her pleading. So I have questions, and that's just the beginning of it. Um, furthermore, Your Honor, um, you know, the black letter law of the state is that in divorce cases, in which equitable division of property is at issue, the conduct of the parties, including evidence of the spouse's alleged adultery, is relevant and admissible. We don't have to plead adultery in the initial petition. But we also have the ability under OCGA 1115 to amend the pleadings anytime up until the entry of a pretrial order. We have the right, regardless of whether or not this, the grounds for divorce alleged in the petition is that the marriage is irretrievably broken, to discover information with regards to adultery. We have questions. I want to know about how he's been spending his money. I have a reason to believe he's spending it on another woman. That's my client's money. And I want to ask questions about that. She's trying to hide under the shield of her position improperly, I would suggest, Your Honor. There's a couple things that are improper about it. First of all, and I'd like for the court to clarify this, it's, there's no doubt that she's, she's busy. She has one of the most active district attorney offices in the state. However, as Mr. Axon cited under 926.1 D2, if you look at that, it says the person proceeding the protective order had unique personal knowledge of one or more matters relevant to the subject matter. We know she did. She put it in her pleading. Um, we also know that she did because although she asserted falsehoods in her pleading, we asserted facts in our response. And those facts, even the ones we've just shown, clearly demonstrate that she's got some unique personal knowledge in this case. But more than that, we're not, we're not seeking her deposition as the district attorney of Fulton County. We're seeking her deposition in her individual capacity as the alleged paramour of my client's husband. So whatever her job is has nothing to do with whether or not she should have to sit for this deposition. I'm sure that it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient for all of us. However, I have questions, and she needs to answer them. I want to bring one other matter to the court's attention with regards to her position that I think has not been highlighted in this. With regards to her position, in her motion, page 9, top of the page, she stated unequivocally, D.A. Willis stated, that if we pursue this subpoena, we are obstructing justice. Yeah, you know, um, Ms. Hastings, that's why I told Mr. Axon to stay away from that. Got it. I don't want to hear that today. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, then, Your Honor, uh, that, that is our argument with regards to the propriety. It's clear that she has relevant information. Okay. Um, Ms. Hastings, correct me if I'm wrong, yes, but in the over two years this case has been pending, we have yet to hold an evidentiary hearing where we heard testimony of either party. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. We've been up to now dealing with discovery disputes. Yes, correct? Your Honor. Okay. And neither party, neither party has been deposed. Correct. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kimbrough, do you have anything to add? I do not. You're sitting this one out? I do not. Okay. okay. We'll take what you flies, uh, read on that thing. <laughs> All right. Well, both sides have good points. Um, Ms. Hastings, I agree with. Uh, the irretrievably broken does not prohibit you from presenting evidence of adultery if that's relevant to equitable division of marital estate or marital assets. 
Um, so I agree with you there. You're not prohibited from getting into that. Um, however, I also agree with Mr. Axon that uh, OCGA 91126.1 is there for a reason. And the key part to me is whether the proposed opponent lacks unique personal knowledge or has unique personal knowledge of a matter that's relevant to the subject matter. And under D1, that statute, uh, that the party seeking the deposition has exhausted other reasonable means of discovery and found such discovery to be inadequate. So really, I'm not in a position where I have sufficient information to make a finding either way of whether the proposed opponent has unique knowledge. Because this case is a divorce, and I understand there are children, but they have attained the age majority. So we don't have to deal with child custody, or visitation, or child support, or who's going to have the final say on the medical or educational or religious issues. So that takes out a large portion of what people normally fight over in divorces. It seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that what we have here is a math problem. Equitable division of the marital assets after determining what they actually are. Alimony and attorney's fees. That's a mathematical equation that we need to solve. The solution will be a number, or three numbers, but the numbers will be expressed in dollars and cents. And without Mr. Wade having been deposed yet or given sworn testimony yet, I'll note for the record we have a hearing set for nine days away where sworn testimony can be presented. Without me knowing what Mr. Wade would say, it seems to me that Mr. Wade would be the first and best source of information on what his income has been and how he's been spending it and that he would have first-hand knowledge of whether he's engaged in an extramarital affair. Only after I hear what Mr. Wade has to say, do I think I can make a determination of whether the proposed opponent has any unique knowledge about these issues? Because once again, this is a math problem and uh, we need to find a solution to. So, with all that being said, I'm not prepared, Mr. Axum, to grant your protective order, but since the deposition is set for tomorrow and our first evidentiary hearing is set for the 31st, I will issue a stay. And I will stay the deposition until I'm in a better position to make a determination of whether the proposed opponent would have any unique knowledge. Unique being the key word there. That is not possessed by Mr. Wade himself. Now, if there's not anything else, I need to seat a jury in a criminal case. Anything else? Nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Axon. Ms. Hastings. Nothing further. Mr. Kimbrough. Nothing further, Judge. Thank you. Y'all can uh, email my court reporter. That'd be sufficient. Email the court reporter about the takedown. Everyone's excused. We're in recess for 1.30. <laughs>